good man by sandy mitchell as the tide of war swept across the sabbath worlds most of us could be forgiven for taking more notice of its rise than of its ebb but after the battlefronts moved on leaving rock pools of conflict and its aftermath beached by their withdrawal the vital task of restoring the pax imperialis was only just beginning on world after shattered world a veritable second crusade of those with the necessary expertise to manage the reconstruction followed hard on the heels of the first which was how zael linda came to vergast around the middle of 771 among a swarm of administratum functionaries charged with the restoration of good order there he wasn't much to look at so typical of his brethren that he might have escaped notice altogether had he not worked so assiduously at coming to my attention but that was to be later and to really appreciate his story i suppose we'd better start at the beginning we can only imagine linda's reaction to his surroundings when he first set foot on the shuttle apron at kanak armed men were everywhere in the uniforms of PDF regiments or the Imperial Guard units left to garrison the planet, and the scars of the recent fighting were more than evident on the port facilities surrounding him. Come to that, as most of the shuttles approaching the Northern Collective overflew the glass-walled crater where Vanik had once stood. He'd probably seen some of the worst devastation even before his arrival. For a man used to the musty recesses of a scriptorium, the noise, bustle and constant tang of combustibles from the surrounding manufactura must have been disconcerting in the extreme. Nevertheless, by all accounts, he rallied at once, shivying the small knot of brown-robed scribes towards the rail terminal, though few of them were quite so quick to adjust to their new surroundings as he was. The echoing hall with its multitude of platforms, from which services departed to destinations throughout the North Col and beyond, probably seemed as alien to the administratum adepts as the landing field had been, but they found a local service into Kanak itself without much trouble. The Vergastites had become used to off-worlders by this time, particularly bewildered-looking ones speaking strangely accented Gothic, and the booking clerk, who wrote out their tickets in a flowing copperplate hand, directed them to the correct platform with all the polite deference due to customers he'd overcharged by about 5%. The train rattled its way to Kanak Hub in little more than an hour, affording Linda a few brief glances of the spoil heaps and outlying reclamation zones, before burrowing into the side of the western spine like a worm into an apple. The last couple of kilometres of track ran within the low hab levels, through tunnels and caverns of steel and brick, some spaces large and open enough to seem like small towns in their own right, while in other places the enclosing walls whipped by disorientatingly just the other side of the window. The hub terminal was more crowded than anywhere they'd seen so far, and the little knot of off-world adepts navigated it in an apprehensive huddle, following the directions they'd been given as pugnaciously as the curlicures of an ancient text being restored to legibility by a fresh layer of ink. Once again, Linda took the lead, although he was by no means the most senior member of the party but he had more local knowledge than any of the others, furnished to him by a friend and colleague who'd arrived in an earlier wave a year or so before, and who had corresponded diligently in the interim. He'd already knew how to flag down one of the municipal carabanks thronging the outer concourse, and how to distinguish the combination of numeric and colour coding which marked one heading in the right direction. How grateful! his colleagues were, for being saved a five-kilometre walk, mostly in an upwards direction, isn't clear. But I presume the majority were relieved to find what seats they could among the shift-change crowds. What really matters is that Linda eventually ended up where he belonged, at the Administratum Cloister, 
But the details of his journey are important to someone like me. To whom details are everything. In that relatively brief trip from the landing field, he demonstrated the single-mindedness and adaptability which set him apart from his colleagues and which were to lead him down darker paths than he could ever have dreamed he would walk. The first intimation that something was wrong would have been when he registered his arrival in the Codicium Municipalis, where he had been assigned to work, and inquired about the friend who had preceded him to Vergast. No record of that individual exists, the junior archivists on the other side of the polished wooden counter informed him, with the neutral inflection peculiar to lowly functionaries trying to appear not to relish the chance of making the lives of their superiors more difficult. Please check again, Linda said calmly. He'd been navigating his way around the labyrinthine ways of the data stacks for most of his life, and was well aware that information could be lost or mislaid in a myriad of ways. Allow for misspellings and cross-references with the arrival records of the landing field. The results are the same, honoured scribe, the archivist told him, after a wait no longer than Linda had expected. There is no reference to a Hall Citrus in any of the informational repositories accessible from this cogitation node. Then I suggest you commence an immediate archival audit, Linda said, since the data I require has clearly been misfiled. As you instruct, honoured scribe, the archivist said, suppressing any trace of irritation which might have entered his voice. There were worse ways of wasting his time, which Linda could easily impose if sufficiently irked. Would you like a summary of the results forwarded to your cubicle? I would, Linda said, and returned to his assigned task of tabulating the adjusted output of the Kanak Manufactura, which had altered appreciably in both volume and substance in response to the recent upheavals. The task was a painstaking one, consuming a good deal of time and the greater part of his attention. So he was faintly surprised to find the report he'd requested dropping from the pneumatic tube over the angled surface of his writing desk less than a week later. Setting aside the work he was supposed to be doing, Linda began working his way through the thick wad of paper, annotating it as he went with an ink stick. The anonymous archivist had been thorough, within the limits of his competence, but Linda's greater experience and expertise soon began to pay dividends. And, by the time he was making excuses to the senior lexicographer for failing to finish his assigned task by the compline bell, he discovered a number of discrepant... <laughs> he discovered a number of discrepancies in the archive records, each accompanied by marginalia in his elegantly cursive hand. The majority of the anomalies he identified were in the files administered by the Bureau of Population Management, the department responsible for collating records of birth, death and off-world migration, which it would then use to allocate resources where they were most urgently required. The devastation wrought on Vergast had rendered much of this material unreliable, so Linda was hardly surprised by this discovery, but one discrepancy perturbed him greatly. There was still no official record of Harl Citrus's arrival on Vergast, even though the date was known to him. Turning to his data slate, he invoked Citrus's first missive after landing. We touched down at Kanak on 439770, he read, frowning in perplexity. That's a fair-sized hive, one of the largest left standing after the raising of Vervan and the scouring of Ferrazoika. Claff got us to the scriptorum eventually, after a few wrong turns. Linda read on, skimming through the familiar words. Nothing else struck him as significant, but the date was unequivocal. The frown deepening, he turned back to the hard print on his lectern, and paged through the summary of transits from orbit that day. Shuttle, damsel's delight, grounded pad 17, administratum charter, twelve passengers, Personal effects, cargo amounting to 497 tons, stationary sundries. That must have been the one. 
To confirm the fact, he invoked the cogitator link and examined the manifest in detail. Gallon Clath, lexicographer, and eleven other names. Citruses was not among them. Troubled, Linda spent a further few minutes in search of Clath's whereabouts. His personal quarters were listed as within the bounds of the administratum cloister, but Linda lacked the seniority to access their precise location. That didn't matter, though. The department the lexicographer was attached to was a mere thirty levels away, and a chance meeting would be easy enough to contrive. Perhaps he would be able to shed some light on the anomaly. Citrus, Claff asked, his face crumbling into perplexity. He was much as Linda remembered him, short and rotund, which together with his hairless pate made him look uncannily like an oversized toddler dressed for masquerade in adult clothes. Why do you ask? I've been looking for him, Linda said evenly. Having to explain the obvious was another thing he remembered about the plump lexicographer, which was one of the reasons he'd be so pleased to be transferred to his present duties, away from Claff's supervision. In his letters, he mentioned you were still colleagues. I see. Claff glanced around the crowded buttery, as though afraid of eavesdroppers. There were none Linda could see just the usual crowd of men and women in ink-stained robes chatting idly as they grabbed some pottage or the mid-shift mug of recaf before returning to their data slates and hard prints. But I am afraid I haven't seen him since the transfer. He's transferred? Linda asked. Caught unawares by the brevity of the question, Claff nodded, chewed and swallowed and replied with a stifled hiccup. <gasps> To an another department. He didn't say which. Linda echoed the nod more slowly. There were over 7,000 separate bureaus within the cloister, dealing with everything from disposition of tithing revenue to the certification of left-handed writing implements. And with nothing further to go on, his friend might just as well be on a different planet. Did he ever mention where he was living? He asked. And Claff shook his head. He had a flat somewhere up on the spine. Lots of people live outside the cloister if they can afford it. You young ones, anyway. Too much bustle, if you ask me. Linda nodded again. He was still in the rooms assigned to him on his arrival, having little inclination to expose himself to the ceaseless activity of the wider hive. But Citrus would have relished the proximity of taverns and bars, theatres and brawling pits. Ever since their first meeting as callow archivists, Citrus had been hungry for experience, eager to meet life head-on, instead of vicariously through text and pics. It was an attitude uncommon within the sheltered precincts of the cloister. Perhaps that was why Linda was so determined to see his friend again, instead of accepting that their paths had diverged forever when Citrus boarded the first transport to Vergast over a year before. It must have taken everything he had, he said. Rents on the spine were high. The few adepts he'd meet living outside the cloister, barely being able to afford a couple of rooms in a worker's hab. Clath leaned closer, assuming a confidential air. Between you and me, he said. I don't think he paid in cash. Chachez la femme and all that. Really? Linda considered this unexpected information. Citrus had always enjoyed feminine company, he knew, but the only women he'd had any contact with before had been other administratum adepts, which, given the circumscribed nature of the lives they led, had hardly been surprising. None of them could have afforded lodgings in the hive's more salubrious quarter, any more than Citrus could. You mean he'd taken up with a local woman? which would have been impossible, of course. Nothing in any of the letters he'd received had so much as hinted at such a liaison, but Claff was nodding slowly. I believe so, he confirmed, with the self-satisfied air of someone passing on a juicy bit of scandal. For the last six months, at least. Six months, in which Linda had received free missives from his friend. 
The first had dwelt at length on some interesting cross-reference practices the Vergasite archivists were continuing to cling to in the face of the filing protocols imposed by the new arrivals, and the compromise eventually arrived at to general satisfaction, before rambling off into a description of a few of the local festivals. The second it consisted mainly of enthusiastic comments about the local cuisine, which Citrus appeared to be finding very much to his taste, and the third contained little apart from an account of an inspection of one of the protein reclamation plants to which Citrus had been attached to take notes, and which he'd enlivened with caustic pen portraits of the rest of the delegation. None had so much as hinted at a romantic liaison. Clath had to be mistaken. Nevertheless, Linda supposed he might as well follow it up, if only to eliminate the possibility. In that regard, the mind of a diligent bureaucrat isn't so far removed from the dispassionate pursuit of hidden truths peculiar to my own profession, which meant that, from the moment Linda uttered his next remark, our paths would inevitably cross. Do you happen to remember her name? he asked. As it turned out, Clath wasn't sure, but a little more patient probing on Linda's part elicited the vague recollection that Citrus had mentioned meeting someone called Melina once. That was little enough to go on, but for a fellow of Linda's skills and resources, it was sufficient. There were only so many women of that name living in the spine, and not all of them were of the right age to be of romantic interest to Citrus, and not all those remaining on the list were single. That didn't discount them entirely, of course, but Claff had implied that Citrus was living with his in a Marata, and a husband about the place would have put paid to so cosy an arrangement. Knowing his friend as he did, I'm sure Linda was able to eliminate a few more potential candidates without too much difficulty, but whatever other criteria he chose to apply, he didn't bother to share with me during our subsequent conversation on the subject. Once he got the list down to an irreducible minimum, the streak of determination which had first surfaced during his eventful journey from the landing field displayed itself again. Undaunted by the scale of the task he'd set himself, he began using the limited amount of free time at his disposal to contact the remaining candidates, eliminating them one by one. Most were polite, if puzzled, simply assuring him that they weren't acquainted with his friend, an assurance he generally believed, as a lifetime spent in service of the administratum had left him able to detect evasion or an ease in the harmonics of the voice. A few were clearly suspicious of his motives, and a handful decidedly hostile. These he annotated for possible further inquiry, if he reached the end of his list without any useful result. Whatever his reception, he plodded on, until one of the voices on the Vox reacted in a fashion he'd not experienced before. Good shift change, he began, for the fifty-seventh time. Is that Melania Dravere? Speaking. The voice was brisk, brittle behind a sabre rattle of confidence. And you would be? Zaylinda, we've never met, but we might have a friend in common— do you know a scribe named Harl Citrus? You're a friend of Harl's? The woman's voice cracked a little. Where is he? Is he all right? I was hoping you could tell me, Linda said, a fresh wave of bewilderment, dousing the sudden flare of hope at her first words. I arrived on Vergast a few weeks ago, and I've been looking for him ever since. Arrived? The Vox circuit hummed with... "'speculative silence for a second or two. "'From off-world? "'Kulan. "'I'm with the Reconstruction Administratum,' Linda hesitated, "'wondering if this would be too much to take in, "'but it seemed to be the right thing to say. "'Oh, you're that sail. "'Harl talked about you.' "'Did he?' Linda asked, "'conscious that the conversation seemed to be slipping away from him. "'What did he say?' "'That I could trust you.' The admission seemed a reluctant one. We should meet, compare notes. Maybe we can find him together. I could visit you, Linda suggested, wondering if perhaps that was the wrong thing to say. The woman was 
clearly nervous and might not feel comfortable about inviting him into her home, but she took the suggestion in her stride. Sixty-four via Zoologica, she said, barely hesitating. Can you find it? I can, Linda told her with confidence. He had a plan of the hive in his data slate, newly updated with the latest alterations to roads and transit routes, where fresh construction was scabbing over the scars of the Ferrozoican bombardment. But I won't be off shift until after Compline. An hour after Compline, then, Melina agreed, and broke the connection. Cheered by the unexpected acquisition of an alloy, Linda returned to his work with his usual diligence, and had apparently made considerable progress in disentangling the cat's cradle of information on his desk when he was unexpectedly interrupted by a different knock on the door. "'What is it?' he asked, with some asperity, resenting the disruption of his concentration. "'There's someone here to see you, honoured scribe,' a pale-looking archivist informed him, inserting just enough of his body across the cubicle's threshold to become visible. "'I'm busy. Tell them to wait.' Linda returned to his collection of slates and handprints, already dismissing the matter from his mind. "'That won't be convenient,' I said, pushing past the archivist who promptly fled, his duty done. Linda turned back to the door, to find it clicking too, while I leaned casually against its inner surface. I extended a hand. Will Ferris, Adeptus Arbites. Of course, Linda said, as though my uniform hadn't already told him precisely what I was. Surprise was smeared across his face like a harlot's lipstick, but his handshake was firm, and once he'd registered that I was real and wasn't going away until I was good and ready, his expression became curious rather than alarmed. What can I do for you? You've been looking for Hal Citrus, I said, resigning myself to leaning against the door for as long as the interview took. There was only one place to sit in the narrow room, and Linda showed no inclination to vacate it. So have I. Do you know where he is? Linda asked, and I shook my head. No, I admitted, and that irks me. I'm not used to being hidden from, not for this long, anyway. Why would he be hiding? Linda asked, an unmistakable frown appearing on his face. Surely you can't suspect him of anything. Everyone's guilty of something, I said. That was the first thing I had learned on joining the Arbites. Before you ask, of course, I include myself in that. But there are degrees of guilt and culpability, and sometimes... Things aren't as clear-cut as they seem. Not Hal, Linda said, which surprised me. People usually react to this kind of insinuation by asserting their own innocence. Not of anything that would justify your interest, anyway. I'm interested in a great deal, I told him, which was true. Law enforcement on Vergast was in as big a mess as any of the other institutions, and the arbitrators brought in to sort it out had been forced to take on cases which would have been handed to the locals on more smoothly functioning worlds, including the falsification of records. Hal would never do something like that, Linda said, sounding genuinely angry. Most administratum adepts would as soon profane the name of the emperor as knowingly tamper with the data they were charged to protect. Don't you think it a little odd that so many records relating to him have disappeared? I asked, refusing to raise my voice in return. Linda looked thoughtful. That might be the result of tampering, he conceded. But you've got no proof that Hal's responsible. Nothing definite, I agreed. But innocent men seldom disappear into thin air, unless foul play is involved. Linda paled. Clearly, this possibility hadn't occurred to him. You think he has been murdered? He asked at last. It's possible, I said evenly. But I doubt it. I think he wiped his own records to cover his tracks and hide whatever else he tampered with. 
I'll wouldn't do a thing like that, Linda said again, glaring at me with unmistakable dislike, and I'll prove it. I'll be delighted if you can, I told him. He clearly knew nothing of any use to me. In the meantime, if you should get in touch or you find some trace of him, be sure to let me know. You can count on it, Linda said, in tones which made it clear he regarded the interview as over. How much of his interrupted chain of thought Linda was able to pick up after my departure, I can only guess. But given his stubborn streak, I can imagine he'd pretty much completed his task for the day for by the time he left the scriptorium and headed up Hive to meet Melina Draver. He found his way with little trouble, consulting his data slate from time to time, but generally moving through the shift-change bustle with a resolute determination which left the local operatives I'd assigned to watch him scurrying to keep up. No mean feat, given that most of them were canic born and bred. True to the picture I was beginning to form of him, he took little notice of the barrage of noise and spectacle most men would have found distracting but remained obdurately fixed on his goal. The only time he showed any visible sign of surprise was when he reached the Via Zoologica itself and realised that the road broke through into open air. He paused for a moment, looking down the long, sloping flank of the hive, shining like a beached galaxy below, then strode on, his shadow flickering in and out of existence, as it merged momentarily with the patches of deeper darkness between the waylights. As he neared his destination, skirting a crowded tavern from which jaunty zether music floated incongruously on the night air, he slowed his pace, paying greater attention to the address plates, screwed to the smog-eaten bricks of the overhanging housing fronts. At length, he came to his destination, and knocked, a little hesitantly, after a few moments, a woman opened the carved wooden door, a weary crack. Melina? he asked, unsure of his reception. It's me, Zael. Then you'd better come in. The door opened wider, and he stepped inside, finding himself in an airy, well-lit entrance hall. His hostess was petite, dark-haired, and carried a small calibre auto-pistol in her left hand. Linda had never seen a genuine weapon before, and was taken aback, but before he could protest, Melina had crossed and bolted the door, and deposited the gun on a nearby occasional table. From the number of faint scratches in the marquetry surface, Linda surmised that the gun generally rested there, where it could be picked up easily whenever the woman answered the door. She motioned him through one of the arches leading off the hall, and he found himself in a comfortably appointed living room, roughly the size of his entire lodgings. He looked around curiously, noting the opulent decor, the artful scattering of antiques and objects de art, utterly unlike the contents of any room he'd ever been in before. "'You have a very elegant home,' he said, hoping to break the awkward silence. "'Thank you,' Melina perched on the edge of a sofa, opposite the armchair Linda had selected as seeming least likely to swallow him whole. He was astonished at how comfortable it was. The furniture he was used to was generally selected for its utility rather than comfort. Melina glanced around, as though lost in her own house. Harl found it for me. He did, Linda prompted, hoping for more detail. He couldn't imagine Citrus combing the property vendors, even on a friend's behalf. Perhaps his new department had something to do with accommodation allocation, and he'd found out about it that way. He's helped a lot of people, Melina said. Her face was drawn and tense. He's a good man. Whatever some people say about him. People like Ferris, Linda asked, and the woman nodded, suddenly tense again. How do you know Ferris? she asked her left hand clenching as though closing on the butt of her gun, her eyes fixed on Linda's, disturbing in their intensity. She shifted, almost imperceptibly, a few millimetres further away from where he sat. I don't, Linda assured her, and I don't want to. He came to the scriptorium not long after I voxed you, and threw his weight around. 
Melina nodded. I thought he was monitoring my Vox calls. He's probably hoping Ha gets in touch with me. A flash of panic illuminated her eyes. If he does, they'll be bound to catch him. He's too clever for that, Linda assured her. But why would the arbitrators think he's been doing anything wrong? The idea's absurd. Of course it is, Melina asked, her voice blazing with indignation. But Ferris needs someone to blame, even if he can't prove anything. When Harl disappeared, he just jumped to the conclusion that he must be guilty. More or less what he told me, Linda agreed. He hesitated a little before going on. He did have another idea about what might have happened, but I'm afraid it's rather unpleasant. Let me guess, Melina said. He suggested Harl's been murdered, and someone's trying to cover it up. She smiled, registering Linda's shocked expression. He tried the same trick on me. He doesn't believe that any more than we do. Then why suggest it? Linda asked. Melina's posture became a little less hunched. To see if you'd let anything slip, of course, in case you were in on it. In on what? Linda began to feel completely out of his depth. Whatever he imagines Ha was involved in, Melina said, as though explaining things to a child. I suppose it was at this point that Linda began to realise quite how out of his depth he was. Have you any idea what that might be? he asked. The woman regarded him steadily. Data falsifications about the worst thing an administratum adept could be accused of, isn't it? Linda nodded. Short of heresy. I'm sure Harl told you that. He did. Melina's voice was low. As if, even here, they might be overheard. It wasn't a decision he took lightly. Linda felt the breath gush from his body, as though her words had been a physical blow. Slowly, he stood. I shouldn't have come here, he said, biting back the angry words seething behind his tongue. I am sorry to have intruded on you. Sit down and listen, damn it! Melina jumped up too, her fists clenched. I told you, he did nothing wrong. You also told me he falsified records, Linda snapped back. And I've known him most of my life. Harl wouldn't do something like that, whatever the reason. And I lived with him for more than half a year, Melina said, her voice softening. Perhaps I saw a side of him you never did. But if you don't want to know the truth, then leave. You know where the door is. All right, Linda seated himself again. The desire to make sense of the data was ruling him, as it always would. I'm listening, but I don't promise to believe you. Fair enough, Melina breathed deeply and began pacing the room. I told you, Harl found this place for me before he did. I had nothing, literally. I'm from Vanik, and I was in one of the outhabs when the nuke went off. I'd just stepped into an underpass, crossing the Verven Hive Road at the time. A few seconds either way, and I'd have been vaporized like everything else above ground. All my idents went up in the fireball, along with my home and my family. She took a long, shuddering breath, and Linda found himself wondering if she'd finished. That's... he began, but Melina cut him off with a sharp hand gesture. Eventually, I made it here. It wasn't easy, and I had to do a lot of things I never want to think about again. But without idents, I couldn't find a job or a place to live. That limits your options, believe me. So what happened? Linda asked, not sure he wanted to know the answer. Hal did. We got talking in a bar I used to work. Don't get me wrong, he was never a client, but he used to drink there sometimes, and we got to know each other. One night I was in a bad way, and it all came pouring out. He never said much, but he listened, and the next time I saw him he gave me an ident, genuine, some spinner girl who'd picked the wrong time to visit Vervenhive and never come back. I see. Linda thought about the unthinkable. In circumstances like that, the citrus he remembered might have been tempted to alter the records to help the woman. It would have been easy. 
He could even picture the expression on his friend's face as he shuffled the requisite pieces of data around the cogitator net, the sardonic smile which never quite became a sneer. He'd seen it many times in their early years as lowly archivists, generally directed at him as he failed to follow Citrus in some minor transgression of the regulations. Citrus would have relished the challenge of getting away with it, although the risk of being caught would have been relatively low. Dealing with any hard print copies that existed would have been a little more difficult, but not much so. A scribe's robes could hide a great deal more than a few sheets of paper, and once they were gone, it would be easy to ascribe their loss to the turmoil of war. And something went wrong. No, Melina shook her head. No one noticed. Not at first. At first. Linda tried to get his reeling thoughts under control. What changed? Hal did, I suppose. He must have got overconfident. After he helped me, he decided to rescue some of the other dispossessed. Yes, he would, Linda nodded. Once he'd crossed the line and got away with it, Citrus would have been unable to resist the impulse to carry on outwitting his superiors. He was constitutionally incapable of refraining from pushing his luck. Sometimes that had been an asset, propelling him up the administratum hierarchy, at a rate some of their contemporaries had been openly envious of, and sometimes a liability. Linda had seen him lose a month's remuneration on a single hand of cards before now. Like I said, he's a good man, and now Ferris is treating him like a criminal. Melina paced the room, her slight frame seeming too frail to contain her boiling rage. That must be why he wiped his records, Linda said, considering the matter as dispassionately as he could. To protect you... With his access keys deleted from this system, there's no way of telling which files he accessed. He probably even believed that. A sufficiently devout tech priest might be able to reconstruct them, given enough time to enact the proper rituals. But that kind of knowledge is well outside the purview of the administratum. You won't tell Ferris, will you? Melina asked, twisting her hands together anxiously. Of course not, Linda said wondering if it was true. A lifetime of devotion to his calling was warring within him against the demands of friendship and compassion. It was all too much to take in. Thank you. Melina smiled, with genuine warmth for the first time, the tension suddenly draining from her body. Then, to Linda's astonishment, she hugged him. I've been so afraid without Hal. We'll find him, Linda said with a confidence he didn't feel, and hastily returned the embrace. Then he left. It was close to dawn, a faint greyish glow becoming visible. Through the clouds of smoke rising from the manufactura below and to the east, the rumble of industry continued unabated in the background, mere distractions of day and night irrelevant to the vast majority of Kanak's population. Upon the spine, though, the affluent remained more aware of the diurnal round, and the streets were accordingly quiet, which forced my observers to keep their distance, otherwise things might have been concluded a great deal more quickly than they were. Take this, Melina said suddenly, as Linda turned away from the closing door. He held out his hand automatically, and found his fingers wrapping themselves around the compact weight of the miniature auto-pistol she collected from the hall table before undoing the bolt. I've got another. No, thank you. The metal was cold, smelling faintly of lubricants, and the wooden butt felt warm where she'd been gripping it. It seemed astonishingly heavy for something so small, and Linda fumbled, almost dropping it. I haven't a clue how it works anyway. You point it and pull the trigger, Melina said. It's been blessed by a tech priest to ensure accuracy, but you need to flick the safety off first. Noticing Linda's blank expression, she smiled indulgently. That's the switch by your thumb. Linda almost refused again, then stuffed the little firearm into the depths of his robe. 
The gift was well meant, and he didn't want to hurt her feelings. I'll be in touch, he said instead, as soon as I find out anything else. He wasn't sure how he was going to do that, but had a vague idea of seeing if Claff remembered anything else Citrus might have said about people or places he knew. I'll be waiting, Melina said, but come by anyway. I don't see many people now Harl's gone. I will, Linda promised, and was rewarded with another fleeting smile. The pre-dawn wind was chill and unwarmed by the thermal currents rising from the industrial sectors, and Linda huddled deeper inside his robes as he hurried back towards the tunnel mouth leading to the enclosed depths of the hive below. His footsteps echoed eerily in the unaccustomed quiet, and the shadows between the way lamps seemed impenetrable pools of darkness. The tavern was open again as he passed it, if it had ever closed, the indefatigable zither player still going strong. He considered the likelihood of that for a moment, before realising it must have been a recording. His attention attracted by the music, he paused, considering the prospect of a reviving mug of caffeine and a warm butter roll, then dismissed the idea. He would be cutting the time of his arrival at the scriptorium fine enough as it was, but the brief hesitation was enough. As he listened to the echoes of his footfalls die away, another, caught unawares, smacked into the pavement at exactly the moment his next stride would have been. "'Who's there?' Linda looked round, seeking the source of the sound. But the shadows between the waylights kept their secrets. Unbidden, his hands sought the suddenly comforting weight of the gun. "'Come on out!' No one answered. Feeling vaguely foolish and inclined to blame his fears on an overactive imagination, Linda began walking again, listening to the steady beat of echoes against the enclosing brickwork. His hand curled around the butt of the auto-pistol, the small excretions of the safety catch snuggled against the ball of his thumb. Abruptly he turned, looking back the way he'd come, and was rewarded with a flash of movement, just leaving the pool of luminescence cast by the waylight behind him. Emboldened by the feel of the weapon in his hand, he took a step towards it, drawing the gun as he did so. Who are you? he shouted. But the only answer he got was the slithering of shoe soles against cobbles, as his unseen pursuer turned and fled. A dark robe billowed for a moment in the cone of lamplight, and the diminishing echo of hurrying footsteps rebounded from the surrounding walls. I suppose most men of Linda's profession would have resumed their journey at that point, perhaps with a brief prayer of thanks to the throne for their deliverance. But as I've noted before, he could be a stubborn fellow when the mood took him, and it took him then. Without any thought for his safety, he ran after the fleeting shadow, pausing now and then to catch his breath and listen out for the fugitive echoes. The pursuit took him away from the thoroughfare he'd been following, ever deeper into a maze of alleyways and thence inside the rising slope of the hive spine. He was vague about the details of the route he took, but I was able to reconstruct it later, bringing us to the market hall where he finally confronted his quarry. At that hour it was still deserted. The stall shuttered and empty, but the flood lamps in the ceiling had been kindled, ready for the vendors to set out their wares, and Linda blinked in the sudden brightness. As his dazzled eyes adjusted, he heard more footfalls echoing between the stands and rounded the corner of the nearest row, aiming the gun ahead of him. Stop or I'll shoot! A hooded figure in a night blue robe was crouched over a manhole cover in the middle of the aisle, frozen in the act of lifting it aside. It straightened slowly and began to turn. Would you really, Zell? The words were delivered in an amused drawl, as though the speaker was waiting for the punchline of a joke. You should never make a threat you're not prepared to carry out, you know. It makes you look weak. Hull. Linda lowered the weapon, stupefied with astonishment. What's going on? I'm sure Melina filled you in, Citrus said with a dismissive glance at the gun. You must have made quite an impression on her. 
She doesn't usually let other people play with her toys. She told me what you did for her, Linda said, tucking the weapon away with a sudden flare of embarrassment. Citrus shrugged. It wasn't hard. I'd been thinking for some time about how you could match up a dormant identity with just about anyone, and she seemed the perfect person to give it a try. Ferris doesn't seem to feel that way, Linda said, trying to assimilate this new and unexpected development. If he finds you, he'll charge you with record falsification at the very least. Ferris can catch a cold, showering naked in a blizzard, Citrus said with a tolerant amusement. He glanced down at the manhole next to his feet. But if you want to continue this conversation without interruption, we'd better get below. He's annoyingly persistent, and he's bound to have watchers trailing you. Why me? Linda asked, feeling his way down a rickety ladder. After a couple of metres, his shoe soles scraped rockcrete, and he stepped aside to let his friend descend after him. The pillar of light from above cut off with a scrape and a clank as Citrus replaced the iron cover, and the dimmer illumination of sparsely scattered glow globes replaced it. Because you might lead him to me, Citrus said, the smile Linda had pictured so recently visible on his face as he stepped off the ladder into the gloom-shrouded tunnel. You really are out of your depth here, aren't you? Of course I am, Linda snapped. I'm a scribe, not some dreg from the underhive. I'm not used to this kind of thing. You seem to have more of a knack for it than you think, Citrus said, which is why I took the risk of bringing you here. In case you hadn't noticed, I was chasing you, Linda said. Cyrus smiled again. It saved a lot of explanation. If I'd approached you in the open, you'd start asking questions, and we'd still be talking when Ferris's plodders turned up but I had intended getting a lot closer to this little bolt hole before I let you see me. He nodded appreciatively. You're full of surprises, Zale. Then I'm not the only one. Linda fell into step with his friend, strolling along the dank utility duct as though they were ambling through a garden together. What are you going to do now? Keep my head down and wait for Ferris to die of old age. Citrus smiled again. I set up a nice new life for myself before I erase the old one. I've got money and connections, and I can well afford a juvenile or two. Then why do you want to talk to me? Linda asked as they descended a ramp into a vaulted brick gallery lined with humming power relays. Because I trust you, Citrus said, and you were able to find Melina. I'd like you to pass on a message for me. Of course, Linda said. She's worried sick about you. Then you won't mind putting her mind at rest. Just tell her I'm safe and I've left the hive. Can you do that? Consider it done, Linda said. They were crossing a deep channel of lichen-encrusted brick, along which some thick, tarry liquid flowed sluggishly into the distance, their footsteps ringing on the metal mesh bridge spanning it. Is there anything else? I doubt it. Citrus said, the half-contemptuous smile back on his face. You're already sticking your neck out more than you're comfortable with. I'll decide what I'm comfortable with, Linda snapped. For the last year he'd been living outside the shadow cast by his friend, and he'd forgotten how annoyingly superior he could sometimes seem. Good for you, Citrus stopped walking and looked at him appraisingly, in the light from a nearby glow globe. They'd reached a nexus of tunnels half a dozen radiating from the circular chamber they found themselves in. When he spoke again, his voice was lower. There are plenty more, like Melina, you know, desperate, with nowhere to turn. I can't help them any more. But if you're willing to take the risk, you could. Me? For a moment, Linda was too stunned, even to speak. When he forced the syllables out, it sounded more like a strangulated gasp, then an intelligible word. Citrus nodded. You could give them their lives back, Zale. Then he shrugged. Somebody's life, anyway. It's got to be better than the one they have now. Falsify records. Linda felt nauseous at the very idea. No, I couldn't. No, I don't suppose you could. Citrus gave him 
the look again, and a flare of resentment took Linda by surprise. It had been like that for as long as he could remember, Citrus taking it for granted that he lacked the guts to follow where he led. Suppose I was able to, he said, surprising himself almost as much as Citrus, judging by the unfamiliar expression of astonishment on his friend's face. How would I go about it? You have to go through me, Citrus said. At least to begin with. I've got contacts in place, and the dispossessed, trust me. He looked at Linda, appraisingly again. No offence, Zale, but these are damaged people, who don't give their confidence easily. You'll have to earn it. None taken, Linda said, before honesty compelled him to add. I'm not promising to do it, Hal, but I will think about it. That's all I can reasonably expect. Citrus clapped him playfully on the back. You're a good man, Zale. I know you'll make the right choice. I hope so. <clears throat> Linda coughed uncomfortably. When I do decide, how do I let you know? Ask Melina to hang something red from the second floor balcony. When I hear it's there, I'll arrange a meeting and we can discuss the details. Something red. Right. Linda nodded. Good. Citrus turned away, then paused, and indicated one of the tunnel mows facing them. Head down that way for about three hundred metres, and, and you'll find a green access hatch. It opens into the Tarshari storage area of the scriptorium. Then he smiled again. The familiar, mocking expression returned to his face. So you would have had time for that caffeine you were thinking about after all. Then he was gone. Only the fading echo of his footsteps remaining. I'm a little disappointed, I said, strolling into Linda's cubicle unannounced. I thought we had an agreement. An agreement, he responded, setting aside the hard print he'd been annotating, with a deliberation which made it plain my visit was less of a surprise than I'd hoped. I nodded, taking up my former position against the door. I didn't think he'd make a run for it, but there was no harm in closing off the option. To inform me. If you heard from Harl Citrus, I could count on it, apparently. As you can see, he returned, I'm rather busy, and I don't recall agreeing to speak to you immediately. Fair enough, I conceded. I should have emphasised the urgency of the matter. But you don't deny you spoke to him this morning. No. I don't, he returned levelly, and the substance of the conversation was personal. The fractional hesitation was enough to betray that he was holding something back, but they always do at first. He asked me to reassure Miss Drevere that he's safe and well, which I agreed to do. How kind. I shifted the focus of the questions. And did you discuss the charges against him? Linda nodded, reluctantly. We did. It seems I owe you an apology. Accept it, of course, I assured him. So he admitted it. He told me he'd falsified a few records. As you can imagine, it came as rather a shock. I imagine it did, I said, trying to sound sympathetic. And was he any more specific than that? He said he'd been giving the identities of people killed in the war to destitute refugees. I can't condone it, but he does seem to have been acting out of a misguided sense of altruism. Then it seems he's been a little selective with his recollections, I replied, wishing there was somewhere else to sit. Did he mention how we got on to his activities in the first place? Linda shifted uncomfortably in his seat. That didn't come up in the conversation, he admitted. No, I said. Somehow I don't think it would. It was when a man named Werther Geist returned to Cannock a couple of months ago, after an absence of nearly three years. Geist's quite wealthy, as it happens, with interests all over Vergast, and the last anyone heard of him... He was visiting Vervenhive. So, of course, he was listed amongst the missing. I paused, groping automatically in my pocket for a packet of IO sticks. 
before remembering I was definitely giving them up again. Probably a bad idea to light one up surrounded by a million tons of paper anyway. The thing of it was, he left a couple of hours before the Ferrazoikin attack and ended up in Haraldy, where he got mobilised along with a bunch of the local auxiliaries. And once the security situation eased, he got kicked back into civilian clothes again. Are you with me so far? Linda nodded. So when he returned to Kanak, he found another geist already living in his house. Got it in one, I told him. But the thing is, they could both prove they were the genuine geist. In the end, we had to run a genetic comparison to find out who the imposter was. Which I take it you did? Linda asked, sounding genuinely interested. I nodded. The really interesting thing was who he turned out to be. He was a refugee, right enough, but from Ferrazoika. I watched Linda's face crumble. He shook his head. That can't be right. Hal would never help one of them. But he did. I can show you the transcripts if you like. In the end, I did, just to prove the point. But I could see at the time he believed me. Once he realised we were going to turn the case over to the Inquisition, my suspect got positively voluble, laid out the whole thing for us step by step, what Citrus was doing, and how much he charged for the privilege. How much? Linda was getting angry again, but it didn't seem directed at me this time. Ten percent of the assets the new identity had access to. Seems like a bargain to me, I said. And how many ten percents do you think he collected? Linda asked, his voice thickening. I have no idea, I admitted. I suspect his lady friend was one, but I can't prove it. Then why haven't you arrested her? Linda asked. Because the Arbites isn't the Inquisition, I explained. We serve the law, and we operate within the letter of it at all times. Without evidence, I have no grounds to detain her. I've got a list of names as long as your arm, who reappeared suddenly after being presumed dead. But I can't move against any of them either. So you need Hal? Linda asked. I do. I nodded slowly. And I am open to suggestions. Thank you, Melina said. She was smiling, but there were tears on her face. Just to know he's all right. Linda shuffled his feet uncomfortably, with the display of emotion. I'm sure you'll see him again soon, he said awkwardly. I don't have a soon, Melina said, matter-of-factly. I'm sorry? Linda felt his face twist in a frown of confusion. I'm dying, Zale. For Fran's sake, haven't you worked it out yet? I was only a couple of kilometres from a nuclear explosion. The radiation, Linda said, with sudden understanding. That's right, Melina nodded. I'm getting the best care money can buy, but all it can do in the end is manage the pain. How long? Linda asked, regretting the question at once, but Melina didn't seem to mind. Who knows? She shrugged. None of us do, really, but I definitely won't see the end of the year. I'm sorry. Linda took her hand, hoping the gesture would convey what he couldn't find the words for. She smiled wanly and returned the pressure for a moment, before withdrawing it. Thank you. Come to the funeral, if you can stand it. I'd like to think I'll have a friend there now Har's gone. I will, Linda said. He probably hesitated after that. Conscience, duty and friendship, contending for the last time within him. Then he went on. Do you have something red in the house? Citrus hadn't mentioned how he intended getting in touch again, so when a standard missive capsule dropped from the pneumatic tube over his desk, Linda's first thought that it was simply another piece of paperwork to deal with. Only when he unrolled the script inside did he discover otherwise. Tunnels behind the scriptorium, it read. The message was unsigned, but the handwriting was unmistakably Citrus's. His heart hammering. He left the cubicle. 
It took him several minutes to reach the green access hatch, he remembered. When he did so, it was ajar. Pulling it open enough to admit himself, he scrambled through, then drew it almost closed again behind him, leaving only a faint filament of light to sketch its position in the wall. Al! Only echoes answered him, chasing one another down the dimly lit passageways. Then he saw the fresh impression of an arrow, scored into the crumbling brickwork opposite the hatchway. It pointed in the opposite direction to the section he traversed before, but the corridor was broad and high enough to walk down unobstructed, so he followed the mute instruction without hesitation. After a few moments it opened out into a wide circular chamber, with passageways leading off from it at the cardinal points of the compass. It was high, with a ceiling of domed industrial brick some forty or fifty metres overhead and a series of galleries circled the walls, connected by a pair of spiralling staircases which mirrored one another all the way up the shaft. Each gallery also gave on to a number of tunnel mouths, four or six generally, although a couple seemed to have as many as eight. You took your time, Citrus said, in what seemed no more than a normal conversational tone. Fooled by the acoustics, Linda glanced around, expecting to find his friend a few paces away, only when the words were followed by a chuckle of amusement did he look up, to find him leaning casually on a balustrade of a gallery, three levels above. I came as quickly as I could, Linda replied, without raising his voice either. The cavernous space lent it a faintly echoing timbre, but it carried clearly. He began to walk towards the nearest staircase. Interesting place for a meeting. It works well, Citrus said. Plenty of exits if you didn't come alone. He was strolling casually as he talked, keeping the width of the chamber between them, and scanning the tunnel mouth behind Linda with weary eyes. Who could I bring? Linda asked. Well, it did cross my mind you'd invite Ferris, Citrus said. Linda began to climb the stairway. He came to see me. Same old story with a few fresh embellishments. I think he was hoping I'd turn you in. More than likely. Citrus began to climb the steps on the other side, maintaining the distance between them. So you thought about what I said? I did. Linda reached the first gallery and began to circle it, tilting his head back to keep his friend in sight. But I'm still a little unclear about something. And what might that be? Citrus asked, a weary edge entering his voice. Whether helping Melina was really the first time you'd falsified records. I checked her new idents, and the substitution was flawless. I'd massaged a few files before, Citrus admitted, unabashed. It's easy once you know how. I'm surprised everyone doesn't do it. Linda fought down his instinctive revulsion, keeping his voice as calm as he could, thanking the Emperor for the echoes which helped to conceal his feelings. And... What files would those be? Your own or personal ones? Which would explain Citrus's rapid rise to a position of influence within the administratum. Of course, Citrus admitted. You know how it is. You need every little edge you can get if you want to get on. And any others? Linda persisted. A few. I smoothed a few career bumps for you, for instance. Me? This time Linda wasn't quite able to conceal his shock prompting another indulgent chuckle from above. You surely didn't believe you got where you are on merit, did you? It had crossed my mind, Linda said, refusing to rise to the bait. Citrus was goading him, that was all, trying to assess his trustworthiness. But if you helped, I won't be resigning on principle. Good man, Citrus said. Anything else bothering you? Just one thing. Linda said, starting up the next staircase. Worth a geist. Did you know you were helping a Ferrazoikan? Citrus shrugged. Omelettes and eggs, Zale. You know how it is? Yes, I'm afraid I do. Linda shook his head. You know the worst part. I'm sure you're going to tell me. Citrus was moving quickly now, towards a tunnel mouth. It was now or never. I wanted to believe you. Linda drew the little pistol Melina had given him. 
However convincing Ferris was, I kept telling myself that at least you meant well. I'll take that as a no, then, shall I? The smile was back on Citrus's face. I knew you'd be too spineless to go through with it, but I let myself hope a little too. So much we could have done together, Zell. So much money we could have made. He waved mockingly. Enjoy your files. It's all you were ever really fit for. Stop or I'll shoot, Linda shouted, seeing his former friend about to flee. Footsteps were hurrying along the tunnel behind him, and with a surge of relief, he realised I'd got his message after all. Of course you will, Citrus said mockingly, turning to leave. Linda never remembered firing the gun in his hand. Just a loud report, which deafened him for a moment, and a jolt as though someone had punched him in the arm. To this day, I'm convinced he never intended to hit his former friend. Just startle him. But the tech priest's blessing must have been a strong one, because when he looked again, Cyrus was staggering, an expression of stunned disbelief on his face. How? Linda ran for the stairs, as Cyrus took a couple of steps towards the nearest tunnel mouth and collapsed to the floor. By the time I joined them, Cyrus's face was grey, and he was fighting for breath. Hell of a time to grow a backbone, Zale, he said, a sardonic smile flickering on his face for the last time. Linda turned an anguished face in my direction. Call a medic, eh? he implored. On the way, I said calmly, although if the voices in my comm bead were right about their location, they'd find nothing but a corpse when they arrived. I knelt on the grubby brickwork next to Cyrus. How many other Ferrozoikans did you give new identities to? You know every damn one of them will be tainted by chaos. Do you want to face the Emperor with that on your conscience? You're so clever. You work it out, Cyrus said. Then he turned to Linda. Tell Melina. I'll see her again sooner than we thought. I'll tell her, Linda said, his voice quaking. But I doubt that Cyrus ever heard. I couldn't close the case without a formal identification of the body, and as the closest thing Citrus had to next of kin on Vargas was Melina, I had to ask her. She held up well, all things considered, only showing signs of emotion when Linda gave her Citrus's final message. She heard him out without speaking, then nodded curtly. Remember what I said about my funeral? she asked. Of course, Linda said. I'd rather you didn't come after all. Then she swept out of the sector house like a morning clad storm front. What now? Linda asked, looking faintly dazed, which I could hardly blame him for. Now we do it the hard way, he said. Go back to our list of suspects and pull their records apart. Check for any anomalies, however small, that might indicate they're not who they say they are. I looked at him. Appraisingly, your expertise would be very useful if the administratum can spare you. I'll make sure they can, he said. What about Melina? Aren't you going to bring her in? I shook my head. She's a low priority, I said. We know she's not from Ferrozoica, so she'll keep. We'll get around to her case in a year or two. Technically, I suppose. That was obstruction of justice, but there was no point in prosecuting her. She'd be dead before the case came to trial. Like I said, everyone's guilty of something. Even me. Linda looked at me strangely. You're a good man, he said. Thanks for watching, everybody. I hope you enjoyed that. We're back to doing... Videos, properly videos. I've had a little bit of a break now. My shoulder's repaired itself. Uh, thanks to everybody supporting the channel. Your names are here. I, uh, if, if you've done it recently, um, I'll add you to the next one. So, yeah, it's just sometimes a day behind or whatever. Um, but, yeah, really appreciate it. I understand times are tough. So, if you, if you can't anymore, I completely understand. But if you can, please consider becoming a YouTube member or a Patreon. Because I'm out of work at the minute. So, it all helps. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. Um, at the least, could you please just like the video? Uh, let me know in the comments what you think. And uh, please share if you think anyone would enjoy this. And if you're not subscribed, subscribe and hit the bell and all that. Yeah, stay well, everybody. And I will be back again uh, soon with something else. 
See you later. Bye-bye. Cheers.